I am really excited this morning to welcome the first Rabbi in Residence of the Year presented by the Alvin and Violet Harris Memorial Fund. Uh, he not only is he a colleague, but um, I am fortunate to call him a friend. Uh, Rabbi Adam Greenwald is the director of the Miller Introduction to Judaism program at American Jewish University, the largest learning program for those exploring conversion to Judaism in North America. He also serves as lecturer in rabbinics at the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies. In 2016, Rabbi Greenwald received the Covenant Foundation's Pomegranate Prize in Jewish Education. Rabbi Greenwald is the editor of On One Foot, an introduction to Judaism textbook and curriculum in wide use across the United States and Canada. He's a fellow with the National Center for Learning and Leadership, CLAL's Rabbis Without Borders initiative, and speaks and teaches nationwide on issues of conversion, inclusion, and engagement of Jewish millennials. Prior to coming into the intro program, he served as Revson Rabbinic Fellow at ECAR, one of America's most innovative spiritual communities. He received his bachelor's degree in history from UCLA and his master's in ordination from the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies in 2011. He's married to Anne, an art curator and a consultant. It is a pleasure to welcome back Rabbi Adam Greenwald into our Adat Shalom community. Thanks, buddy. Um, it's really nice to be with you all virtually. Um, I speak and lecture all across the country, but I never leave my bedroom somehow. So it's uh, a funny world in which we're living. I want to thank um, the rabbi for giving me a reason to put on a sports coat, um, which I also realized I hadn't done in several months. Um, before I, I launch into sharing some Torah, and then we also have some time to learn together in a longer way after the service is over for those who have the koach to stick with us. Um, I do want to just acknowledge how fortunate you are in this community. First, um, while he's not here, so I can't embarrass him in person, I have been, had the privilege of davening with Dale Schatz now for over a decade. Um, I did my rabbinic internship down in Orange County at Congregation B'nai Israel, where Cantor Dale also uh, does some gigging, and he is truly, truly a gift. And so tuning in and hearing his melodies and his words, um, just started off my, uh, my Shabbos morning in a really great way. Um, and Rabbi Nolan is, to my mind, you know, the, the James Brown line, the hardest working man in show business, you have the hardest working rabbi in the business. This is a guy who has brought such um, wonderful life to this community, who has um, taken under his wing so many students in the Introduction to Judaism program and really made them, B'nai Bayat, made the members of the family uh, he is an inspiration for what a pulpit rabbi can be, and I just hope that uh, this congregation really knows how blessed it is with its leadership. So thank you so much, uh, Rabbi, for inviting me to be part of this, and it's really, really good to be with you virtually this morning. Um, I am going to talk about Hanukkah, because that is not canceled. Um, whatever the stay-at-home orders we have, we are still lighting the menorah this year. We are still celebrating this year. Um, and so I uh, want to talk about joyful things, but I want to dig deep into, uh, into what's actually going on in the Hanukkah story that I think is so profoundly needed right now. When we learn together over lunch, whatever passes for lunch here, we're also going to talk about Hanukkah. We're going to talk about it in the context of early Zionist thought. And I'm going to share with you an article written by Theodore Herzl reflecting on the meaning of Hanukkah. So I hope you'll stick with me for that. If there is one story that most Jews uh, feel like they can tell by heart, uh, aside from maybe the Exodus story, it's definitely the story of Hanukkah, right? How the Maccabees, after years of battle, re-enter into the desecrated temple how they re the altar and, and pull down all of the idols, and how they went to relight the Ner Tami, the eternal flame burning in the golden menorah, which is supposed to symbolize God's continuous presence in the space. We know how they only found enough pure olive oil to light that menorah for one day, 
and the process of making the extra, 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 extra virgin olive oil it takes to burn the, in the menorah in the temple takes an additional week. But with an abundance of faith, they lit it anyway, and it burned all the way through that week and beyond. It's the story of the little oil that could. This is the story that we learned, most of us in Hebrew school as kids. This is the story that many of us tell to our kids. This is the story that we tell to our non-Jewish neighbors when they ask us, what's that Jewish Christmas about again? This is one of those stories which everybody knows. And like many stories which everybody knows, it turns out it's a bit more legend than reality. The first time the story of the little bit of oil that burned for a very long time gets told is actually 350 years after the events took place. The story of the oil doesn't appear in the book of Maccabees. There's actually four different versions of the book of Maccabees. It appears in none of them. It doesn't appear a hundred years later in the writing of Josephus, who talks extensively about the Maccabee uprising. It doesn't appear a hundred years after that in the discussions in the early part of the Talmud between Hillel and Shammai, the first recorded discussions about the holiday of Hanukkah. It makes its appearance for the first time, as I said, three and a half centuries after the events. So what I wanna to do together is I wanna dig into the real story of Hanukkah, because I actually think that the story of how this legend came to be is in some ways more powerful than the legend itself and more deeply resonant and more deeply needed for this moment than the original story. So here it goes. The Jews had lived for a few centuries under tolerant leaders, first under the Persians, then under the Greeks. We were allowed to practice our religion, to worship in our temple, so long as we didn't make any trouble for the bigger empires and we paid our taxes on time. Then comes along a, a leader, a, a Syrian Greek named Antiochus. He was named after his birth city, Antioch, who had a different perspective. Antiochus, by the way, renamed himself. He named himself Antiochus Epiphanes. An epiphany is uh, you know, a moment of sudden realization, but literally in Greek, epiphanos means a manifestation of God. So here's this guy, Anthony, who calls himself the manifestation of God. You, you can get a bit of a sense of, of how he thought of himself, who took a different approach to this policy of toleration that had been maintained by his ancestors. Antiochus first fires the high priest in the temple who, who, was, who was perceived to be a little bit disloyal, replaces him with a more Hellenized high priest named Jason. Eventually he fires Jason to find somebody even more loyal to him named Menelaus. And eventually he fires all of the high priests and declares in the year 167 that Judaism is to be outlawed. He says in a letter to all of his people, if we are to be one empire, we need to be of one faith. And so henceforth, the study of Torah, the practice of Shabbat, the practice of Brit Milah for baby boys, all of this is to be forbidden. A portion of the Jewish community goes along with this. They are eager to fully assimilate into the Hellenic culture that is seen as the most advanced and sophisticated of its day. But of course, there's a small group that engages in rebellion, that fights back for the sake of Jewish liberation, this army that calls itself the Maccabees. Now, we don't actually know 100% where the name Maccabee comes from. The most popular etymology for this is from the word makah, which means hammer. These are the Hebrew hammers who hammered back at the Greek positions and fought a guerrilla war. It's also possible that Maccabee is an acronym. Maccabee, mi chamocha ba'elim adonai. That line from Exodus 15, who is like you, O God, 
that we sang as we crossed through the Sea of Reeds on our way to liberation. The Maccabees are successful. In three years, they managed to push the Greeks out of Jerusalem. A few years after that, they managed to push the Greeks out of the land of Israel entirely to restore Jewish sovereignty for the first time in 500 years to the land. They indeed do go into the desecrated temple and they indeed do recasha the altar and take down the idols and they do light the lamps. But again, that story of the oil is conspicuously missing from the contemporaneous accounts. Instead, we're told that we celebrate an eight-day festival of rededication. The word Hanukkah means to dedicate a building. A celebration of eight days because of Sukkot. Sukkot was the biggest holiday of the ancient world. It was the massive harvest festival that everybody celebrated. In ancient sources, Sukkot is simply called Hechag, the holiday. And Sukkot had to be canceled for three years on account of a war. We know a little something about holidays that need to go onto the back burner um, on account of dark times. And so when we had for the first time the opportunity once again to come together in celebration, we held a do-over Sukkot, eight days of feasting and festival in the temple. I am imagining, and part of what is keeping me alive right now, I am imagining the party that's gonna happen after we all get this shot. 28 days after we all get this shot, when we're all good to go, it is going to be, it's gonna be something. We are gonna to have to roll in a year's worth of festivities. There is gonna be so much hugging and so much dancing, I can't wait. So they hold this do-over Sukkot for eight days and from that time forward, we continue to maintain that tradition. So where does the story of a little bit of oil burning for a long time come from? Well, for that, we're gonna to have to go into the history that we don't tell the kids in Hebrew school. As Rabbi said earlier, um, Judaism is a religion for adults. We often package it for children, but we leave out some of the juiciest and, and most interesting and important parts because they're really not meant for the littlest of kids. Here's what happens after the Maccabean Revolt. You see, it turns out that the Maccabees, like many freedom fighters throughout history, were brilliant army tacticians and absolutely lousy government administrators. This is a repeated pattern in history. There are many, many examples of groups that are great at fighting for their freedom. And once they win that freedom, they wind up very quickly replicating the broken model that they had just thrown off. The Maccabees within a matter of decades become just as corrupt as any of the Greek leaders that preceded them. They become tremendously Hellenized themselves. And within a hundred years, the country is in civil war. The last Maccabean king, his name was Aristobulus, which is a Greek name. You can see within a hundred years, this uh, army which had risen up to fight off Hellenism now is led by a king with an unrepentantly Greek name. Aristobulus goes to the Roman Empire, this rising ascended empire in the Mediterranean at the time, and says to them, I am losing control of my country. How about I become your vassal king and you support me and, and, and we go into this together. And the Romans say, we would be delighted by that arrangement. And so in the year 63 BCE, the Roman army marches into Jerusalem, not as an army of conquest, but at the invitation of the last Maccabean king. This, by the way, would be the end of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel until May 14th, 1948 the end of Jewish sovereignty for 2,000 years, and it happened because of the weakness and corruption of these freedom fighters whose great-great-great-grandfathers had liberated our land just a century before. In March, the Romans, and, and the Romans do indeed bring order. The Romans were very good at order. 
They build roads and aqueducts. If you've been and traveled around Israel, you've seen some of those roads and aqueducts were built so well, they continue to stand to this day. They build this beautiful desert fortress on top of a mountain called Masada, and they do this massive remodel of the temple complex. The Romans contribute a lot during their time, but after about 100 years, the Jews start to get antsy. And we say to the Romans, we appreciate the roads and we appreciate the aqueducts and that remodel of the temple sure is fantastic. But your taxes are too high and your punishments for the least bit of rebellion are too harsh. Remember how we invited you here 100 years before? Time to go back to Italy, guys. And the Romans say, we think you've misunderstood kind of what's going on here. We're not leaving. And the Jews say, no, 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 party's over, guys, go home. And the Romans say, I'd like to see you make us. And so the Jews rise up under the banner, remember the Maccabees. Remember how little beat big? You remember how weak beat strong? Remember how we fought and won our, our freedom? We can do it again. We can fight off the Romans. And we rise up in rebellion in the year 66 of the Common Era, and we get crushed. We get utterly crushed because Greeks and Romans are totally different. Right? What, what are Greeks interested in? Wine drama, philosophy, fetiches. What, what are Romans interested in? Romans are interested in war, right? If, if all of us in the Zoom were able to get all together, we could probably conquer Greece. But Rome? Rome is a different matter entirely. And so under the banner of remember the Maccabees, we rise up, but we get crushed. And our temple, that temple that the Maccabees had rededicated and cleansed is reduced to ashes and rubble. Jews are slow learners, so 50 years later, we try it again under the leadership of a general, Bar Kokhba, who calls himself the son of a star, a sort of messianic figure who says, we can beat the Romans, little can beat big, we can beat strong, remember the Maccabees. And in the end of the Bar Kokhba revolt, hundreds of thousands of Jews are dead. The city of Jerusalem is plowed to the ground and rebuilt as a Roman city that Jews are forbidden to enter. The leadership of the remnant of the community that survived these two disastrous wars, the rabbis, get together and say, we are not going to survive a third. We can't keep doing this remember the Maccabees business. We need to tell a different story. And so it's at this time that those rabbis stop talking about the military victory of the Maccabees and start talking about the spiritual power of a little bit of light that burns against a great big darkness and refuses to go out when everybody thinks it should. You get what they do in the story? They take it and they make it a metaphor. It's not going to be about what we can accomplish by the force of our arms. It's going to be about what we can accomplish by the force of our spirit. Who, what does the light in the menorah come to symbolize? It doesn't symbolize oil that burned for a very long time, uh, for a, a very long time ago. The light in the menorah symbolizes us. We're still here. We're still shining bright. We're not going anywhere. That's the miracle that we're meant to publicize. And I think that that story, that story about spiritual resistance, that story about spiritual persistence is really the reason why there are still Jews 2,000 years later populating this Zoom Brady Bunch screen in 2020. The fact that we have told over the course of centuries the story about ourselves that we are the little light that could 
and that the light is going to grow rather than diminish, even in the face of a big darkness, that's the secret to Jewish survival. And I got to tell you, it's the secret to the survival, uh, to our survival in 2020. You know, I, I'm a fixer. I think a lot of people in helping professions are fixers. We, when there's a problem, we like to come up with solutions. And I'm also, if I'm being really honest, a bit of a fighter. Right? If something is threatening me more, if something is threatening my family, I want to fight back. And there are some people in this really dark year who are called on to be fixers and fighters, the heroic doctors and nurses and medical staff that are putting themselves on the line day after day. If there are any people here in this congregation who are doing that work, God bless you and keep you safe. The heroic scientists who are researching at breakneck, unprecedented pace to produce for us a vaccine which may start going into people's arms this week. Per, the, the, the meeting for the emergency use authorization is Erev Hanukkah, right? Could it be more perfect? It's the 10th, that on the night when we start celebrating the miracles of the light overcoming the darkness, that's the, the night that they're gonna make the decision if we can start getting these shots. But most of us, most of us, myself included, we can't fix what's been going on this last year. And we can't fight what's been going on this past year. You can't fight a virus the way you could fight an enemy out there. It's part of what's so frustrating. What we're called on is to be the little lights that keep burning against a big dark. What we're called on is not to despair is not to go out, is to not let the darkness that's all around us consume us. We need Hanukkah right now more than ever, but the truth is, is we've been living Hanukkah through this year. If we have continued day after day to put on our mask, day after day to protect and take care of our neighbors, day after day to take care of our children under impossible circumstances, day after day to choose to do the right thing, to protect one another, we have been living the Torah of this moment all the way through. So we're getting, God willing, close to the end, guys. We just have to hang on a little bit longer. And the darkness is really deep right now. It's really scary right now. And it would be very possible it would be almost tempting to despair right now, to say, I'm tired, I'm done. But that's never been the Jewish way. We are the people who are forbidden to despair because we have faced down big darknesses before and we've responded to it by being little persistent lights. I bless us all that we stay safe I bless us all that we shine bright. I bless us all that we gather together when this is all over for a big do-over festival with joy and love and laughter. And in the meantime, that we celebrate the miracle that we're all still here. That is something worth celebrating. Hag Sameach, friends. Thank you, Yasher Koch, Rabbi Greenwald. Uh, I hope that everybody stays with the service. And uh, after Kiddush and Hamotzi, we will um, have our proverbial bagels and cream cheese while we listen and uh, have a, an interactive uh, learning with Rabbi Greenwald. And now um, I'm going to invite Rabbi Greenwald to the front of the social hall. We can all put it in context like we used to see it, right? to the front of the social hall while we're all enjoying our bagel lox and cream cheese. Um, some of us uh, whitefish, raise your hand if you choose whitefish. That's all right, fantastic. Thank you, Dennis, for playing this game. Uh, and uh, thank you, Janet. Um, I think Jersey also raised her paw. And, um, and now I hand it over uh, to Rabbi Greenwald. 
Thanks, though. I got to say, I appreciate this drama that's been going on. Um, and uh, but I was really coming to expect that there was a courier coming to the door, maybe a Postmates delivery with some bagels. And I'm, I've been a little disappointed so far. But we're, we're really good at chassid, but we're not that good yet. Next, yet. You know, God willing, we'll never have to get that good. But uh, no. uh, right. <laughs> I will have to take care of carbs on my own, thankfully, as you can <laughs> clearly tell from the screen. I've had no trouble right. with carbs, especially during the pandemic. <sighs> Hi, everybody, again. Uh, and uh, thank you for the real-time feedback in the chat. You know, you uh, stand up in, in what we previously used to think of as just regular times and give a drush, and you have no idea how it's landing. And I see that uh, with, you know, a dozen or so people, it landed well. And so I appreciate that. And nobody wrote into the chat yet, oy, that rabbi, I can't believe all the heretical things he said. But you'll tell uh, Rabbi Leibovitz about that later. Um, and I'll hear about that later. Um, we are gonna do some learning together over the course of the next half an hour or so, um, talking about the role of the memory of the Maccabees in early Zionist thought. Um, many of us know that Hanukkah uh, is a relatively minor holiday in the Jewish calendar. It's not one of the Torahitic holidays that comes with work restrictions. Um, Hanukkah in the old country was an opportunity to give the kids a couple of coins, some Hanukkah gelt, um, maybe fry up some potatoes, though that's frankly um, what uh, everybody ate seven days a week anyway. Um, Monday potatoes, Tuesday potatoes, Wednesday potatoes. I seem to remember a Yiddish song like that. Um, but Hanukkah had a major resurgence in the 20th century for two reasons. One reason is its uh, coincidental closeness to Christmas, um, which is not so coincidental of, at all. Um, we celebrate our holiday of lights at the time when the world feels the darkest, and they celebrate their holiday in which the light of the world entered um, at the time of greatest darkness. There is a thematic similarity for why we both celebrate these holidays in the winter. But in an effort to keep up with, uh, with Christmas, we bumped up our game on Hanukkah, and this became the holiday in which they may get one day of presents, but in the words of Rabbi Adam Sandler, we have eight <laughs> crazy nights. And if you have not seen um, the new video that came out just yesterday, done by David Diggs of Hamilton fame, um, for Hanukkah, I Want a Puppy. It was produced by the Disney Channel. It was actually produced by a woman who converted to Judaism this week. Um, she had her baits in on Tuesday and went to the Pacific Ocean to do her immersion. And so she's already contributing to the Jewish people in big ways. We really upped the present giving game of Hanukkah in order to compete with Christmas. But that's not actually the only reason that Hanukkah has gotten this major lift in the last century. The other reason is that the early Zionist thinkers really latched on to the memory of the Maccabees as a model for what tough Jews who take back their land can look like. Right? They had to go looking in our history for where they could find Jewish heroes and role models to inspire um, fighters and farmers who were establishing a new country. And they went all the way back 2000 years to the story of the Maccabees. As you probably know, the official seal of the state of Israel is the menorah. Um, that's not a coincidence. They, early Zionists were linking the reestablishment of the state with the memory of its, re, of its rebirth under the Maccabees. So um, we're going to look at a couple of texts, one uh, poem, um, and then the promised article from uh, from Theodore Herzl. And I hope, as the rabbi said, this will be a discussion rather than a lecture um, as we, we look through and think about the ways in which um, the fathers and mothers of the state of Israel um, drew on the tradition of the Maccabees to inspire um, what is the, the undoubtedly the most incredible Jewish project of certainly the last century and arguably the last couple of millennia.
the rebirth like, of the staff well, is wrong. You don't mind me just jumping in for one minute. If somebody Always. has a question or a comment, um, the best way to go about this is to enter it into the chat um, instead of just unmuting and jumping in as I just did. And, um, and, and then you know, Rabbi Greenwald will uh, be able to see it in the chat. Or if not, uh, towards the end, I'm, I'll, I might just recap a bunch of questions and we can kind of uh, engage in a conversation in that way. Um, Perfect. And so Rabbi Leibovitz, you'll, you'll monitor that a little bit. I'll, I'll keep an eye on it too. I'll do my best. Between the two. Great. All right. So um, before we look at the um, Zionist uses of the Hanukkah story, let's look at how the Hanukkah story gets told in our Siddur. Um, this line is a line that's traditionally said after the candles are lit, sort of summarizing the reason that we just did that. Of course, in my house, as soon as the candles were lit, we descended on the presents, so we never really got to this line. But I'm told in more observant and disciplined homes, um, they say, Hanera Talalu. Um, Hanera Talalu Anu Madlikin, Al Hanisim Ve'al Niflaot, Al Teshuot Ve'al Milchamot Sheasita Labotenu Bayamim Ha'hem Basman Hazeh. The Sidur's one sentence summary of why we light the candles. These are the candles that we light. We do so for the sake of the miracles. That's the Nisim, the miracles, the wonders, the salvations, and the battles that you fought for our ancestors in those days and at this season. In the Sidur's summary of what Hanukkah is about, who is the hero of Hanukkah? You can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself just this one time. Who's the hero of, uh, of the Hanukkah story right here? Elohim. Which translates for the rest of us as God, big G. God is the hero of the Hanukkah story, according to the Sidor. We light these candles for because of the miracles. That's the miracle of the Maccabees victory and the miracle of the oil for the wonders, for the salvations, and even for the milchamot, the wars that who fought? God fought for our ancestors at that time. The way that our tradition has recorded the, um, the way that our tradition has recorded the memory of the Hanukkah story is that this is something which God did for us and we celebrate those miracles. Now, at the end of the 19th century, this idea, which had been a tiny fringe idea among some Jewish intellectuals in Europe, that perhaps Jews who had been waiting for 2,000 years for the Messiah to bring us home might actually be able to enact that reality for themselves, might be able to, in the words that Herzl famously used in his address to the First Zionist Congress, um, make that our dreams reality through our will. If you work for it enough, if you believe in it enough, if you enact it in the world, it need no longer be just a dream. They were interested not in what God could do for us, but they were interested in what we could do for ourselves. And so this famous poem um, written in 1951 by Ahron Zev, um, Aaron Wolf, which is still recited, um, sung actually every year at the National Israeli Tekes, the, the gathering at Har Herzl, the military cemetery and the cemetery in which the founders of the State of Israel are buried in Jerusalem on Yom HaAtzma'ud, on Israeli Independence Day, before the chief of staff of the IDF lights a big memorial torch, this is sung aloud. And this is really a summary of the thinking over the 50 or 60 years that preceded the writing of this poem of what the Hanukkah story meant for those early Zionist halutzim, for these pioneers. We are carrying the torches in the dark night, the paths shine beneath our feet, and whoever has a heart that thirsts for light, let him lift his eyes and his heart to us and come along. Nes lo karalanu. 
פח שמן לא מצאנו. לעמק הלכנו, ההר עלינו, מעיינות האורות גנוזות גילינו, בסלע הצבנו עד דם ויהי אור. No miracle happened for us. No cruise of oil did we find. We walked through the valley, ascended the mountain. We discovered wellsprings of hidden light. We quarried in the stone until we bled. Let there be light. I want to focus on that second stanza that I read in Hebrew and English. And uh, I'd like to hear your reactions. Um, what's going on in this riff, um, this sort of lived midrash on the Hanukkah story being told by somebody who lived through the early years of the state and the years before its founding. What are they describing? I'm going to read it one more time as we think, and then I'm going to invite you, if you'd like, to, to unmute and share your thoughts. No miracle happened for us. No cruise of oil did we find. We walked through the valley and ascended the mountain. We discovered wellsprings of hidden light. We quarried in the stones until we bled. Let there be light. What's, what's going on here? He sounds like a non-religious Zionist. Rina says he sounds non-religious. Why do you say he sounds non-religious? Because uh, I think that's kind of the philosophy of the non-religious Zionists. Do it ourselves, you know, don't wait for God. I, I feel like he's, Hahar is the Har Moriah, which is the, the hill of Jerusalem, and Emek is maybe Emek Abacha, the, the the Valley of Tears. So I sort of feel... Like many re people in Israel, they don't aren't religious, but they're they're sort of like steeped in what it says anyway, religiously, and take inspiration. So Rena said, "This feels like the embodiment of the Zionist philosophy here, or at least the non-religious Zionist philosophy. We are going to make our own reality. Remember that Zionism in its early years was seen as a heresy." that Zionism was rejected roundly by the religious world because we were supposed to be the ones who prayed for God to bring us home. And the idea that a collection of mostly secular, mostly socialist, mostly disconnected from religion and from the community folks would get together and do what God hadn't done, that was, that was unthinkable. Um, and then... I only see Jonathan's name there. I don't know the name. I don't know your name who just spoke. Aliza um, just spoke. Aliza just spoke and, and started already to say, you know, what, what is this mountain that we're climbing? What's this valley that we're going into? Har HaMoriah, the Mount, Mount Moriah, the mountain on which Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac, the mountain on which the Temple Mount stood, was a mountain that God invited us to climb. And Elisa's saying, no, God isn't inviting us to climb it. We're climbing it. The, the valley of, of tears, the, maybe the, the valleys that surround the city of Jerusalem, those aren't the valleys of God. Those are the valleys that we enter into. Um, I saw maybe Ronnie wanting to speak. Yeah. Stephanie Ginsburg, okay. um, Stephanie yeah, Ginsburg um, providing light, provides in us. And Letitia Reyes, a student from Miller program from our class on Thursday, welcome, wrote, Redemption is up to us. All fantastic uh, ideas. And Ronnie, go ahead. Ronnie is unmuted. I think it refers to the Holocaust. I have to say more, please. I think the poem refers to what happened to the Jews, the Holocaust. How so? Um, well, I go back to it. I can't see it now. <laughs> I will show the poem again. It's, it's always the trick when you're doing share screen so we can see each other and talk and also see the poem. Yeah. No miracle happened to us. No cruise of oil. We walked through the valley and then we, we quarried in, until we bled. And, you know, let him, 
So, so it's all dark and and or or the history of the Jews in the diaspora, but specifically the Holocaust. Right. He's writing this poem six years after Auschwitz is liberated. Right. He is writing this poem and he's saying. If God was supposed to show up and work miracles and fight our battles for us and save us like the poem did, God was derelict in God's duty. There was no miracle for us. We didn't find any cruise of oil. We were the ones who walked through the valley. And here, um, Eliza, Eliza said, um, the valley of tears. I think about Psalm 23. This is Gates al Mavet. This is the valley of the shadow of death. Right? We walked in the valley. And in the psalm, it says, we didn't walk alone, right? You, even in the valley of the shadow of death, you were with us. And maybe the poet is saying back in the valley of the shadow of death, where the hell were you? Ascending the mountain? We had to do that. Maybe the mountain here is, is Sinai, right? God's supposed to be on the top of the mountain. The truth is, is we're the ones who had to climb. We had to do it for ourselves. And so there is an anger in this poem, Ronnie, I think that, that I'm hearing from you that says, God, if you were supposed to show up, you, you didn't. So we had to take matters into our own hands. We're getting a lot of agreement in the chat with Ronnie. And Esther is uh, throwing an idea. Definitely sounds like ascending to Eretz Yisrael and building our future. And, um, uh, and Stephanie Ginsburg points out uh, another metaphor. Without darkness, you can't see the light. Um, uh, if, is there anybody who hasn't spoken already who would like to speak? Dad, uh, if you can unmute yourself. I think this poem refers to the fact that we paid for the land of Israel with hard work and our blood, and that's why it belongs to us. This is, this is certainly saying nobody gifted this to us. This isn't a, a, a gift from God. This isn't a gift from the United Nations. This is the product of our own sweat equity and blood equity. We were the ones who needed to find those wellsprings of hidden light. Of course, the imagery among early Zionists that was so powerful about bringing water to the desert. This was certainly a huge piece of, of Ben-Gurion's philosophy. I can't help but see that in this word of, of wellspring and this idea of quarrying in the stone until we bled, right? We had to draw the raw materials out and we paid for it, as Jerry, you said, we paid for it in blood. And what's the, what's the last line in this poem? The last line, Vaihi or, whose line was that originally? That was God's, right? Let there be light. In the creation story, the very first thing that God brings into the world by God's word is light. And here, who is saying vayihi or? These pioneers and fighters who are saying, all right, God, you did the original creation, but this recreation, this one is up to us. Let it be. Let there be light. I see three people who are unmuted. Yeah. Um, who have not yet spoken. Um, yes, I, I have something, Henny, Henny Gordon. So yeah, I, I'm thinking of a line from uh, The Fiddler on the Roof, where they're in the shtetl and they need to leave for America. And they said, well, we've been waiting for the Messiah, but we're going to wait for him somewhere else. So we made our own uh, home in Israel. Um, it, it was different a little bit from going to America, but in the sense of a refuge for us yeah. uh, when we, we had to uh, get away from the darkness that befell us. I see something in the uh, last, next to last sentence, we discovered wellsprings of hidden light. And what I'm seeing is that I, you know, had the, good, bad fortune of meeting a number of survivors. And those survivors that I've met are really extraordinarily speaking, people of faith. They're, they have gumption, they have faith, they believe they do. And, and I see that in, in this 
in this piece? I've seen a different side of survivors that could go either way. Some of them, there is that anger of where were you, God, when we needed you? And the other is, well, we are making our own home and we are claiming it for ourselves. Our faith makes us stronger. So Henny and, and Miriam, I think whether that strength gets expressed in faith or it doesn't get expressed in faith, sometimes it gets expressed in a almost fierce atheism. I, I know a man well who was a partisan fighter in Poland, but shows up every and shows up every week to show. He is a staunch atheist. Um, and I asked him, you know, why, why do you show up in Shul? And he says, I am his majesty's loyal opposition. I'm here uh, 70 years after my experience because I'm not letting anybody, and that includes God, drive me out of Shul. It's kind of fascinating, right? What, what anybody who has been through this experience of survival or what anybody who was a participant in the upbuilding of this incredible project of the land of Israel has in common, whether it's expressed in faith or not, is a profound strength. That's a universal. I've never met a survivor who didn't have a profound strength. I've never met somebody who's involved in those early years of Israel who didn't have a profound strength. And that's because of, of all of this work that it took to, uh, to survive and to build. Um, can, I, can I say something? Vakasha, please. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, this is written in 1951. Uh, Israel was in very, very, very early infancy. And uh, I think the whole poem refers to the miracle that happened uh, with the with the uh, creation of the state of Israel, it, it's uh, it's a miracle that happened. It it is a miracle because it it happened against all odds, and uh, and it 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 happened with uh, with with our fighting and our strength and our determination, and uh, and and not a miracle from God. And uh, I was, uh, <laughs> a few years after 1951, I was in the Israeli army, and this was one of the most um, uh, common, most, most heard of song that we sang, this exact song. Uh, it has a very nice melody, and uh, it, I was new, I was a new immigrant at that time, and I couldn't understand every word, but it, it sounded so inspiring to me and so um, um, wanting to know more about, about how this whole thing happened. Uh, and it's all because of this song. Thank you for sharing that. And, and you know, what you said, Gerda, is, right, this is a miracle, but not a miracle from God. This is a miracle that we made for ourselves. And that's very different. So if we, if we look at the Sidor's telling of the Hanukkah story, God fought our battles. God made the miracles. And if we look at the Zionist retelling of the Hanukkah story, we made our miracles. We fought our battles. We are the ones taking on the role of saying, Vayahi or, let there be light, let there be something new. And it's, it's a profoundly empowering, but a very different approach to this story. Now, I said Hanukkah and the Maccabees were important in Israeli and Zionist thought um, from the beginning, from the choosing of a semel, of a, of a national symbol in 1948, choosing the menorah, going to, um, in 1929, a uh, young Russian immigrant to the land of Israel who wanted to show that Jews could be strong and tough too, um, establishing what he called the Maccabee Games, which continue to be played to this day, the Jewish Olympics named in their honor. And going all the way back to the intellectual father of the Jewish state, uh, Theodore Herzl. Herzl wrote an article in 1897 three months after the convening of the first Zionist Congress, 
um, in which he plays with the image of the menorah and of Hanukkah. Um, Rabbi Leibovitz told me um, preferable in bringing um, to this group because I can tell everybody talks and has questions, which is wonderful. He said, bring you know only one side of one page because otherwise we'll never get through his stuff. I had to bring you the whole article, which is a bit long. So we're going to have to move a bit quickly through it in order to keep within time. So please forgive me if I, if I pause or we don't have every piece of discussion, because I want you to see this whole thing. Somehow in a good Zionist education, I never saw this article before. Um, and it's really quite something. So this was published, as I said, 1897 in Der Welt, which was the Zionist movement's newspaper. Um, Herzl himself was a highly secular Jew. He um, was bar mitzvah and then never set foot into a synagogue again until the Shabbos before the first Zionist Congress convened in Basel, in which he was invited um, by the rabbi of Basel to come to the synagogue and take an aliyah. And he wrote in his diaries that he was more nervous getting up and saying the prayer for the Aliyah than he was about leading the first Zionist Congress because the idea of standing up in a synagogue for the first time since he was a 13 year old boy was really quite terrifying to him. In 1895, so two years before this is written, he recorded in his diaries an incident of lighting a um, Christmas tree together with his children, lighting you know the candles on the tree as they often did in Central Europe. So he was a highly, highly secularized Jew, even with a Christmas tree inside of his own home. But something started to shift in him as he be went deeper and deeper into this Zionist philosophy that he was helping to build and, and to propagate. Um, he was encountering Jews not from Central Europe, but very highly assimilated Jews that he met in Vienna and in Paris, but starting to um, meet Jews from Poland and Russia who were still a bit more religious. And start, he started to see Zionism not just in secular political terms, but as a more of a spiritual movement. He writes around this time that ultimately Zionism is not just about a return to land, it's about a return to Judaism. And he writes this piece in, um, in the Zionist newspaper, Der Welt. Um, he writes it in the third person, but it is very clearly an autobiographical piece. He writes it about a man introducing his children to Hanukkah. And I'm going to read through it quickly and pause a few different moments. Once there was a man who deep in his soul felt the need to be a Jew. First of all, that's interesting, right? Um, we think of Jewish as something that one either is or one isn't, something that one was born into or one wasn't born into. Of course, somebody could join the Jewish people through conversion. But here, he, he's talking about himself. He's, he's a Jew. He was born Jewish. He was raised Jewish. He was given a bar mitzvah. Um, so what does he mean, he, a man who felt in his soul the need to be a Jew? A sense that maybe Judaism in him and maybe Judaism in many others had gone dormant. He writes, his material circumstances were satisfactory enough. He was making an adequate living and was fortunate enough to have a vocation in which he could create according to the impulses of his heart. You see, he was an artist. He had long since ceased to trouble his head about his Jewish origins or about the faith of his fathers. When the age old hatred reasserted itself under a fashionable slogan. Like many others, our man too believed that this movement would soon subside. But instead of getting better, it got worse. Although he was not personally affected by them, the attacks pained him anew each time. Gradually, his soul became one bleeding wound. What's Herzl talking about here? What's driving him back to Judaism? Anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, which in... Vienna, which is where he was serving as a journalist, was, a, um, was undergoing a, a, a sort of sinister metamorphosis in the Enlightenment. The old hatred of Jews that had been associated with the medieval church and the charge that Jews had been the killers of Jesus 
had morphed using this new racial language that was becoming popular in Europe in the late 19th century. Um, 19th century is the era of the isms of socialism and capitalism and communism and nationalism. It's also the era that gifts us racism, this idea that human beings are biologically different than one another. And it's in Vienna that um, in the 1870s, the term anti-Semitism is coined using a racial um, grouping, Semites, rather than a religious grouping, Jews, to try to make it more, as he says, fashionable. So anti-Semitism is on the rise. And anti-Semitism is driving a desire for him to reconnect to his Jewishness. The secret psychic torment had the effect of steering him toward its source, namely his Jewishness, with the result that he experienced a change that he might never have had in better days because he had become so alienated. He began to love Judaism with a great fervor. At first, he didn't fully acknowledge this mysterious affection, but finally it grew so powerful that his vague feelings crystallized into a clear idea to which he gave voice. The thought that there was only one way out of this Jewish suffering, namely to return to Judaism. That's an interesting idea, right? It would seem there are, is a more obvious way out of the suffering wrought by anti-Semites. What's the more obvious way out? If anti-Semites don't like you for being Jewish, Stop being Jewish. It would seem that anti-Semitism should drive a person away from Jewishness. But instead, Herzl has this opposite, almost paradoxical reaction as they, the anti-Semites, are pushing down harder and harder, are making things harder and harder for Jews. He is responding by feeling the need to get more and more Jewish. Can anybody identify with this feeling? Has anybody had an incident or a moment in their life in which this idea from Herzl rings true for you? I, I actually have one. Please, Do Liz. Like there? Yeah, of course. So back when I went to a Jewish summer camp before Gilboa, this was Camp JCA back when I was about 10 years old, and we went into Big Bear on a field trip, and we had these JCA hats, and the counselors all told us, take them off when you're in Big Bear. They're really anti-Semitic. They're probably best to, you know, not show that you're a group from a Jewish summer camp. So, of course, I put my hat on anyway. And then they said, well, some of the kids said, oh, well, someone asked. We're going to say it stands for Jesus Christ Almighty. <laughs> <laughs> but I wore my JCA camp hat and was proudly Jewish. And that is, you know, I just felt like that's the only way I'm going to face this, you know, thing that we're being told that um, hide because there are anti-Semites there. But I didn't. <laughs> I think, I think many, Lewis, is that a hint? Yes. Please, sir. <laughs> oh, well, I had a thought that going back to my childhood, oh, back in Connecticut, <clears throat> and that when we were read in this synagogue and across the street was a uh, uh, park and the kids from Mary Abbott would come down and they would be, they were Jew haters and they would even re rep, rep our books that uh, happened to be out there. And so that was a um, something which really stuck with me all my life. And my belief in it saying that, you know, being Jewish is very important and that there were other people who were haters of Judaism. Thank you. I think, I think many of us have had, if we haven't had this personal experience, there's a, a certain um, Newtonian element to this, to, to each and every, to each force um, that comes one way, there's an opposite and equal reaction. As anti-Semitism grows, so too often does our sense of, of Jewish solidarity. Um, and uh, somehow the anti-Semites wind up producing the thing that they most want to suppress. Um, my grandmother, um, who's going on 90, likes to say, we Jews are like eggs. You boil us and boil us, and we just get harder and harder. Um, 
It's a very bubby sort of lime. So Herzl is experiencing this as Central Europe is boiling, he is doubling down on this identity. In his patient way, I'm back to the, the essay, in his patient way, our man over and over again displayed the courage of his conviction. There were a number of changes which he himself found hard to accept, although he was stubborn enough not to let on. As a man and an artist of modern sensibilities, he was deeply rooted in many non-Jewish customs, and he had absorbed ineradicable elements from the cultures of the nations among which his intellectual pursuits had taken him. How is this to be reconciled with his return to Judaism? He says, I'm a pretty secular guy. I feel this desire to be Jewish, but I am in my culture and of my culture. Perhaps the generation that had grown up under the influence of other cultures was no longer capable of that return, which he had discovered as the solution. But the next generation, provided it were given the right guidance early enough, would be able to do so. What does this remind us of? I think it calls us back to the generation in the desert um, that Moses led. Right? Moses takes the generation out of Egypt and is told by God, you can't start a new people with the Egypt generation. That Egypt generation is actually gonna have to die away in the desert in order that a new generation conceived in liberty can rise up to build the state. Herzl says, I'm not actually gonna be the one to be able to do it because I'm a European, no matter how much I might want to someday be an Israeli, this country he's imagining, I don't think I'm ever gonna get there. But maybe I can create a different reality for the next generation, for my kids. And so he says, I'm gonna start celebrating Hanukkah with them. Two years ago, he had been lighting the Christmas tree. Now he's going to, uh, to bring home a menorah. In previous years, he had let the festival, which for centuries had illuminated the marvel of the Maccabees with the glow of the candles pass unobserved. Now, however, he used it as an occasion to provide his children with a beautiful memory for the future. Um, and, um, an attachment to the ancient nation was to be instilled early in these young souls. A menorah was acquired. And when he held this nine branch candelabrum in his hands for the first time, a strange mood came over him. In his remote youth, in his father's house, such little lights had burned, and there was something intimate and homelike about the holiday. This tradition did not seem chill or dead. The custom of kindling one light with another had been passed on through the ages. The ancient form of the menorah also gave him food for thought. When had the primitive structure of this candelabrum first been devised? Obviously, its form had originally been derived from that of a tree. The sturdy stem in the center, four branches to the right and four to the left, each below the other, each pair at the same level, yet all reaching the same height. A later symbolism had added a ninth shorter branch, which jutted out in front and was called the shamash, or servant. With what mystery had this simple artistic form taken from nature been endowed by successive generations? And our friend, who after all was an artist, wondered whether it would not be possible to infuse new life into the rigid form of the menorah, to water its roots like those of a tree. What's he talking about here? He says, we want, I want to be part of a rebirth, but that rebirth can't be the same as it was before. It can't just be what's been passed down to us by our parents and their parents and their parents. We need to give new water to the tree. We need to have new life that can flourish up with this new generation. And so we're gonna need to be reverent to the past and also flexible with the past. I think we saw that in the poem where we began, right? A connection to Hanukkah, but also a, a retelling of the story quite dramatically different than the Sidur's telling of the story. We're gonna to need to water this tree on our own and see what form it can take in our, for our reality and for our kids. Something which doesn't evolve, which stays static forever, dies. Something which can be reimagined anew for a new generation has the capacity for immortality.
So Herzl is inviting us to a, a project of imagination. How can we draw from our Jewish roots, but also yield new growth for a new and different world? The first candle was lit and the origin of the holiday was retold. The miracle of the little lamp, which had burned so much longer than expected, as well as the story of the return from the Babylonian exile, of the second temple of the Maccabees. Our friend told his children all he knew. It wasn't much, but for them it was enough. When the second candle was lit, they repeated what he had told them. And although they had learned it all from him, it seemed to him quite new and beautiful. In the days that followed, he could hardly wait for the evenings, which became ever brighter. Candle after candle was lit in the menorah, and together with his children, the father mused upon the little lights. At length, his reveries became more than he could or would tell them, for his dreams would have been beyond their understanding. Right. Herzl is seeing in, um, in these little lights uh, a vision of the future, and he's calling back to the stories of Jewish displacement, the Babylonian exile, the second temple, which had to be rebuilt on the rubble of the first, the Maccabees fighting for religious freedom, and it's inviting him to dream. When he resolved to return to the ancient fold and openly acknowledge his return, he had only intended to do what he considered honorable and sensible. But he had never dreamed that on his way back home, he would also find gratification for his longing for beauty. Yet what befell him was nothing less. The menorah with its glowing brilliance was indeed a thing of beauty and inspired lofty thoughts. So we set to work and with an expert hand sketched a design for a menorah which to present to his children the following year. He made a free adaptation of the motif of the eight arms of equal height, which projected from the central stem to the right and to the left, each pair on the same level. He did not consider himself bound by the rigid traditional form but created again directly from nature, unconcerned with, our, with other interpretations, which of course continued to be no less valid on that account. He's returning to the wellsprings, but drawing something new, not bound to the rigid traditional form, but connected back with nature, connected back with the land, with the growing earth, something which he can pass down to his children that can be a transformation and not just a continuation of the past. And then the last paragraph. With such thoughtful occupation the week passed, there came the eighth day on which the entire row of lights is kindled, including the faithful ninth candle, the Shamash, which otherwise serves only to light the others. A great radiance shone forth from the menorah. The eyes of the children sparkled. For our friend, the occasion became a parable for the enkindling of the whole nation. First one candle, it's still dark and the solitary light looks gloomy. Now when, when the Zionist idea was first articulated, it was a fringe idea. It was an idea that met with resistance from the religious, as we talked about before, because it was heresy. It also met with resistance from those who were happily assimilated, who were secular, who said, the thing we want most of all is to be fully accepted here in our European homes. What are you doing calling for Jewish separatism, a Jewish state of our own? And so the few people articulating this idea thought of themselves as the lonely first candles trying to project out a light into a world that wasn't interested. But then it finds a companion, and then another, and yet another. That's how a movement gets built, one person lighting the next. And the darkness must retreat. The young and the poor are the first to see the light. Then the others join in. All those who love justice, truth, liberty, progress, humanity, and beauty. And when all the candles are ablaze, everyone must stop in amazement and rejoice at what has been wrought. And no office is more blessed than that of a servant 
of light. Isn't that beautiful? Right? Herzl is writing this three months after the first gathering, which had committed itself to the Zionist project. He's writing almost exactly 50 years before the establishment of the state. The man who said, if you will it, it's not a dream, is acknowledging that he, like Moses, isn't going to be the one to bring us to the promised land. He's not going to get us there. How does he think of himself? He thinks of himself as a shamish, as the candle which can start to light the other candles, and that bit by bit the glow becomes stronger and stronger until the darkness has no choice but to retreat. And soon enough, step by step, it's so beautiful, this full menorah, that all the world can't stop, can't help but stop and look and be amazed. So this, this imagery of, um, of the Zionist project, refracted through the lens of the Hanukkah story, by the way, the last line in Herzl's Der Judenstaat, the Jewish state, um, his most read pamphlet was a new line, a new generation of Maccabees will rise again. That was the last line of the pamphlet. This going back to our ancestors who once long ago fought for our religious freedom, who reestablished our sovereignty in our homeland and taking on their mantle seeing ourselves as the ones who can um, relight the lamps, the ones who can um, create a new reality, different than the reality that we were past, but no less beautiful. And, uh, and that it's not gonna come from God, it's gonna come from us lighting one another, spreading the ideas, spreading the commitment, um, spreading the, the love. Um, and leading to a very different world. So hope that's interesting and, uh, and a bit inspiring. Would love to hear any reactions in the last minutes that we have. Yashri Koch, Rabbi. Um, Rina Panush has her hand up. Lou Sternfels has his hand up. Um, yeah. If I could encourage, uh, Henny has her hand up. So we'll take those three uh, questions or comments. If I can encourage all of them to be as succinct as possible. Um, uh, go ahead, Rina. Um, well, it's interesting that in one of the writings, Herzl gave up on the ideas, on, on the idea of using the establishment, the rich established Jews, to help him in his endeavor. And, and he says very specifically, he's going to use the poor, the masses, in fact, that's the word, he's going to use the masses to get this idea going. And it's interesting that in this piece that Adam read, he says, the poor and the young that he's gonna use the poor and the young. And that's what Herzl did. He, that's how it happened, by getting the masses excited. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Lou. Yeah, I couldn't resist thinking based upon your prior contacts during services and now of the contrast and similarities between Israel at the time of the BCE to CE times and those of these times from the 18th to the 23rd centuries. And then there were so much terrible conflict um, as, as BCE to CE times and the rise of so many seeking ways out of it. And as you said, the rabbis resurrected Judaism. Others created Christianity in its many forms. Different others were murderers. Now we can, <clears throat> we are not at the same time, but there are similarities in conflicts, but we celebrate now uh, in, in one way by bringing the lights of the Hanukkah candles to say that there are better times. Okay. Better, better times ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lou. Yeah. Um, now we'll go on to Henny. Yes, I, I can't help thinking the, the image of the uh, Herzl seeing himself as a shamus 
my late husband, John Elvisholm, escaped from communist Hungary and had lived there through the Holocaust and, of course, extreme anti-Semitism and came to this country. And he went directly to Penn State University, where he became a Shamas at Hillel. Mm. And he went back to his Jewish roots, and we met and we established a Jewish family. And it was, that was his dream. So I, I was very moved by this whole discussion with Herzl. I'm going to get his writings and read, read some more. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Thank you, Annie. Um, uh, Rabbi Greenwald, if you'd like to um, uh, conclude, and um, uh, I just want to thank you again for joining us today. It, it, the pleasure is mine. Um, thank you so much for having me. And you know, I, I, I go back again to that thing that you said during the service, which is that Judaism is a religion for grownups. It's a wonderful heritage to pass down to children, but there is so much here that needs to be explored from, from an adult perspective. Hanukkah is a holiday which we have um, largely turned over to the kids. It's a celebration of um, presents and parties in better times. Um, but there's so much here in this story that invites our reflection. Um, so much in the history, so much in the way that the story has been adapted and transformed over time. Um, it can be a really powerful lens with which to see the the whole of Jewish history and, and the whole of what brought us here. And so it's really a pleasure to get to look um, at this holiday together with uh, with all of these wonderful people. Thank you again for uh, for having me. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, everybody.